craft guys welcome back to my channel Kazzy here in this video I'm going to be sharing with you all of the books that I read in the month of April I'm actually resting on all of the books that I read because I can't because I actually read 10 books 10 in April I didn't think I was going to get through five because by the midpoint of April I had only got through about two books maybe three so I thought it was going to be like the worst reading month that I would have so far but it actually turned out to be the freaking best because I got through 10 books 10 10 10 how the heck did I manage 10 so yeah we've got a lot of books to talk about so I'm just gonna cut this intro short and so let's just get into them <music> in April was Heart of Iron by Ashley Poston. This is pretty much billed as Anastasia meets Guardians of the Galaxy and I can definitely see why that is. Anna, she has been orphaned and she doesn't really remember anything from her youth and she only remembers being part of this space crew so that pretty much follows in where the 20th century Fox Anastasia story comes from. The rebellion happens and she loses her memory and all of this occurs. I enjoyed this book. I really did enjoy it but it was disappointing at the same time. The plot was good. I enjoyed the plot. It had some very good twists and turns. There were moments I was just like, whoa. But there were moments when I was like, okay, is something gonna happen? When, what's gonna happen next? Can we get to move on a little bit? So I kind of built it up so much in my head because Anastasia is one of my favorite animated movies of all time. I know it, I could act in it. Guardians of the Galaxy is pretty much my favorite Marvel movie. Probably an unpopular opinion, but it is my favorite. The space crew that Anna falls in with and is Pretty much like adopted by they remind me so much of the ravagers from guardians of the galaxy and anna reminds me a lot of anesthesia this is where the disappointing thing comes from the characters are weak this book kind of reminded me a lot of what annoyed me about daughter of the pirate king by trisha lavenseller for somebody that's been raised by space pirates you would think that they would be stronger and more bloodthirsty and not as caring about what other people think of them but Anna is like that. I pretty much just loved the captain in this book. I love the space captain. She is like feisty and great. There's good representation um, in this book as well. I enjoyed that but it, just the characters were just a bit lacking for me in my opinion and so that's why I give it four stars instead of a full five. After Heart of Iron, I picked up Fantastic Beasts and More to Find Them by Newt Scamander, aka JK Rowling. If you didn't know, and I literally mentioned it in pretty much the last lock of videos that I've done, I recently watched Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them and fell completely and utterly in love with them. So I picked this up at work and oh my goodness, it, it's just the, the cutest little thing ever. I love all of the information in here and the definitions of all of the creatures in terms of how dangerous they are. I really enjoyed that. I love the foreword by Albus Dumbledore. That is ridiculously adorable. I loved it. And then of course Newt's foreword as well. The one thing I will say about this is that it does have three of the houses of Ilzamorny but it doesn't have Pukwudgie. Why is that? As you find out in Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, this book has multiple editions of it. When they're in first year at Hogwarts, I think they have the 52nd edition or 50th something edition. Who knows between this version of it and the ones that the Harry Potter lot get, they, Pukwudgie could be in it, who knows? It was such a good fun and quick read. That's the thing about um, April, I, th I just thought that I would get a couple of good quick reads in here, but no, these are all sizable books. After Fantastic Beasts Somewhere to Find Them, I picked up Crooked Kingdom by Lee Bardugo. This is the finale to the Six of Crows duology and holy Jesus in this book, amazing. Lee Bardugo has been crowned as my queen. She can do no wrong. Her twists and turns, her plot twists kick you in the freaking teeth and before you even realize it. There were so many twists and turns in here, I just could not book this, put this book down. But I had to put this book down because I wanted to savor it because I knew once this book was over that this was over. And I'm so glad that I read it and took my time with it. I actually took this to Manchester with me and read it in the car, on the boat, and just, it, it was just awesome. I love the characters. They were just so endearing to me. I think Jasper and Nina are actually my two favorites now. Oh my goodness, I didn't 
think I was going to love those two. I thought Kaz and Inej were going to be my favorite ones because Kaz, Kazzy, you get the point. But no, Nina stole my soul and my heart. She is just epic and I love some of the fan work for it because she just looks like Scarlet Witch from Marvel and Scarlet Witch is my favorite so I'm just like yes. What happens to her in this book I'm just like whoa did not expect that loving it and Jesper his sass knows no bounds I love him ridiculously much but what I love so much about Kirby Kingdom is yes the twists and turns were amazing but the world building and Lee Bardugo made you feel so much for these characters and they're sass and they're so intelligent and they're so loyal to each other and I absolutely adore that. This is a page turner, like nothing else. Lee Bardugo is my queen and I cannot wait for King of Scars to come out. A cameo in this by a certain character from the Grisha trilogy. Yes, I was living for that. I cannot function to, enough to speak about this book because it's just everything. I can see why a lot of people prefer the Six of Crows duology to the Grisha trilogy. I can t I can see that now. Oh my god. There was no doubt that I gave this five stars. And also I give um, for that space I'm gonna find 4.5 because I didn't have Pop Guajina. In the month that was pretty much sponsored by Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, I read Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, the original screenplay by J.K. Rowling because I had to. I am just obsessed with Fantastic Beasts and I just love the cover artwork in this and I bought it when I was in Manchester and so I read it pretty much when I came home and I just wanted to watch Fantastic Beasts and I read this alongside it because at times when I was watching Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them in the early stages I struggled with what they were actually saying in terms of what the creatures were actually called. Sometimes um, in English they drop off the last consonant and so you're like okay is there an R on the end of that? Is there a T on the end of that? I started watching it with the subtitles and but I just wanted to have this and read it and just see if there was like um, deleted scenes in it just possibly but no this pretty much stays right with the movie. I love the way it just like says all of the exterior shots, interior shots. I started writing those at creative writing class when I was at university which I find very enjoyable just seeing all of that. I love this and of course it was five stars. After Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them and the epicness that was Crooked Kingdom I didn't know what I wanted to read. I was just staring at my bookshelves and nothing was jumping out at me like read me next. But then one evening I was on our exercise bike and there's a big massive bookcase with all Danielle Steele books and one of my resolutions was to read some Danielle Steele. So I picked up her latest one which is called Accidental Heroes and this takes place um, in one day in the space of about five or six hours. It follows a group of characters on a flight from New York to San Francisco, whatever the time frame is for that actually. I think this story was partly inspired by the suicidal co-pilot that downed a plane in Germany. I think it was either the co-pilot or the pilot. They took control of the plane and downed it. It also probably took inspiration from Sully, the plane that paraglided, that glided down to land on the Potomac. And so that's where I think Danielle Steele took her inspiration from, from this story and it follows all the characters about how the TSA agent noticed something suspicious in the bin at security and then she mentioned it to her boss and then she called security and the police and they started to investigate. It might have been nothing but then they were better safe than actually sorry. Additionally it follows the pilot, the co-pilot and a retired pilot and the cabin crew on said flight. Some of the characters I was really rooting for, Captain Helen Smith, I was rooting for her to save the day. The cabin crew, I felt for them. The families of these people that are involved, I felt for them. The ones investigating everything, I was rooting for them the entire time. I was like, yes, get it, get it, uncover everything, just do it. Even when the climax of the book came together, I was very, very entrenched in it. I was like, I need to know if they survive. I need to know if this person lives. I was hooked. I'm glad I read it. And my mom, you see my mom, when she found out that I was reading this, she was like, have you got to that part yet? Have you got to that part yet? Oh, just wait till you get to that part. I was like, stop it. She would have given me spoilers if I had asked her what this book was about because my mom 
typical Irish mum. She cannot tell you a plot of something without telling you the entire story of the book. So I'm never going to ask her what the plot is for a book ever again because I'll just read the inside jacket and be done with it. I'm really hoping to read more Daniel Seal. She's no Leigh Bardugo, let's say that. After that I read Star Wars The Last Jedi, the novelization by Jason Fry. This was actually a very quick read for me even though it's like, like quite a sizable little book because it pretty much followed the movie to a T. It had what you might call deleted scenes and to be perfectly honest I'm kind of glad that they were deleted in the final movie because they didn't really add anything. I personally would have loved more scenes with Holdo and with Leia or even Poe but really the action just focused on Rose and Finn and a little bit of Rey. That was fine but I didn't really need to see more of Rose's jealousy of Rey. It's pretty much spelled out on the screen. And Jason Fry writes in a way that, you know, it just keeps going and going and going and it flows freely, it goes at a good pace. And I loved a, a couple of the insights with Leia about Ben um, slash Kylo Ren, but to be perfectly honest, there wasn't a lot else going on in this book. It was still very enjoyable, it was still four stars, I think, yep still four stars. I just would have loved to have a bit more of Haldo, especially when she was standing on the bridge and the refugees were like going on the transports. I, just to have seen what, what she was thinking in that moment instead of, you know, what Rose was feeling about Ray. Still enjoyable. After that, I read Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince by J.K. Rowling. This month was literally just sponsored by J.K. Rowling. It really wasn't, but it felt like that. I actually listened to this on audiobook and it's narrated by Stephen Fry. That was freaking hilarious because I didn't know that um, Fleur had such a an appearance in this book. And so when he, when Stephen Fry was doing his French accent for Fleur, he literally made her sound like Officer Crabtree from Hello Hello. Not a good look when you're trying to imagine the impossibly beautiful image of Fleur Delacour and you're just seeing Officer Crabtree. Moreover, when he did his voice for Dumbledore, all I could see was General Melchett from Blackadder Goes Forth. The biggest image ruiner, way to use English, ever. Eventually I just started reading it and whenever I got to Dumbledore I just heard Michael Gambon's voice in my head but at times I just still heard Stephen Fry. Nevertheless, it was still a very enjoyable audiobook. I actually preferred audiobook to reading it because he didn't make Harry sound so annoying. If you don't know, Harry's not my favorite character. I find him very annoying, especially in Order of the Phoenix. I actually would have DNF'd Order of the Phoenix had I not just decided, you know, let, let's just get through this. Hopefully he'll turn around. In this book, he doesn't sound so annoying. He actually sounds a bit more driven and a bit more mature. I don't know. I didn't find him as annoying. I enjoyed him in this book. I enjoyed everybody. Even Ginny was not as annoying in this book as she is in the movies. I really enjoyed her in this. I really enjoyed it. I've only one more to go and then I'm finished the Harry Potter series. Who knows? I might read it again. Who knows? Who knows? I don't. After the Hot Blood. After the Half Blood Prince, I listened to the audiobook of The Best Awful by Carrie Fisher. Five stars. Instantly, five stars because that woman, the way she writes is just hysterical. I personally really have started to enjoy using audiobooks when I go for runs because they're a better distraction than music because you're actually paying attention to what the words are so you can imagine it and you can pay attention to it a lot in greater depth. It's great for running. But what's not great for is when she gets to really hysterical moments and they're hysterical moments that take you by surprise because you're not expecting them and you're just wanting to burst out loud laughing. You're running and you're just wanting to burst out laughing. People think you're certifiable. I really enjoyed the story. It's a carry on. I'm not sure whether it's an actual sequel or a companion to Postcards from the Edge but it follows the same character Suzanne Beale and oh my gosh Suzanne is just interesting I think is the word for it. I really enjoyed her character. I really enjoyed the story of her. I loved her kid. I loved the other auxiliary characters. They're just so funny and so witty and oh my goodness I absolutely loved it so so much and I think 
that with that, The Best Awful, that is me caught up on all of her books, I think. But The Best Awful was the last one that I couldn't get my hands on, so I just used the audiobook and loved it. And the thing that I love most about Carrie Fisher's audiobooks is that the way she narrates them is perfect. There are times when, you know, with an audiobook, they're just reading it and reading it. But the way she does it, the perspective that she uses it, it's just great because she can just like flippantly say this line or just put this emphasis on this word or do this voice or this thing. And it just works. It, it's just so unique to Carrie Fisher that I just absolutely adore it. And I think I'll be listening to the audiobooks over and over and over again. So maybe get used to seeing more during the year. After the best awful and I really, really craptastic day at work, I was near on the verge of having like three anxiety attacks in the one day. I was a very limp three, so I'm sorry. I decided to pick up another book and I wasn't sure what I wanted to pick up. Um, I just knew I wanted to read something that I loved. And instead of reading Fantastic Beasts again, because um, I now have the illustrated edition. I actually picked up Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children by Ransom Rigg, which is one of my favorite books of all time. As soon as I started reading this again, I was like at home. I love this book so, so much. What I love about this is that it brings me back to characters that made me fall in love with reading again. Just before I started reading Stranger Dreamer, I had Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children. It's actually one of the first books that I've actually talked about on my channel. Can you believe it? It brought me back to these characters, brought me back to this world, brought me back to Miss Peregrine, who's one of my favorite female characters. I adore Ransom Riggs's writing. I adore the photographs that are in included in here. Of course, I can't find one. There's Fiona. I absolutely adore this book and it was such a quick read because this is my third time reading it. I'm so glad that I reread it because then I can remember exactly what's going on and the next book, A Map of Days, is coming out in October and when I was reading this I actually found out what the, A Map of Days is because it was one of those that I didn't remember from the book and so I'm kind of glad I reread it and so that I know what the title of the new one means and I'm so excited for that because I think it concentrates more on America and the fact that they have less embryons and even less rules so I think that's going to be very interesting and I'm going to wait because I love Miss Peregrine so so much and of course this is like five stars because favorite book duh and the last book that I read in April is because this woman was born in April I want to read it on her birthday which was April 29th and if you know who that is it'll be no surprise that I read Born With Teeth, a memoir by Kate Mulgrew. This is, I think, my fourth time reading this book, so it was no surprise that it took me no time to get through it at all. I started listening to the audiobook and then finished off reading it. I just love this woman so, so much. I love this memoir. She is so eloquent. She is so articulate. Everything is just blissful. And the one thing that I absolutely adore about this book is that Kate Mulgrew doesn't paint herself as anything admirable or pristine or holier than thou. She is real. Fallible. She has flaws. God knows she has flaws. She makes mistakes. She's made lots of mistakes. Um, but she owns them and she owns up to them in this book. And she is so honest and unashamedly truthful about what has happened to her in her life and everything in between. And I am just I adore this woman so so much and I just had to read it for her birthday. And so that makes book number 10 in this reading wrap up and of course it was 5 stars. There was no question whatsoever, right? Whew. And there you have it guys, those are all the 10 books that I read in April. Wow. 10 books. I think my record for books is 11 and that was in October. I still don't know how I managed to do that. And I still don't know how I managed to do this because as I said at the start of the video, I thought I like going into April, but halfway through April, I thought I was only going to manage maybe five, but I, I, got, I got twice that much. So let me know in the comments down below if you've read any of these books or do any of these books tickle your fancy. Subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you in my next video. Bye!